As everyone in the West knows, the war that's raging currently between Ukraine and Russia on the Ukrainian soil was an unprovoked, uh, an, an unauthorized attack by the Russians into Ukraine, which, well, actually, do they? That, that's what a lot of people, I, when I say they know that, the real question is, that's what we think. Because when you actually look at what was really going on, uh, and some of which was not reported by Western media, some of which was, but none of which has in the past. And then you see what uh, Western leaders have been ad nauseum repeating uh, since that time. You mm -hmm. can understand why people actually do in the West believe that Russia's attack was unprovoked. And of course, it's really important to ascertain how this war actually started. And was there a provocation? Because that leads into the current narrative that so many in the West are trying to to, uh, to funnel. And that is that the, uh, the Russians, if they are not stopped in Ukraine, are going to keep going. So if you believe that the war was unprovoked, then you may also believe that, yeah, and Putin will keep going. The Baltics will be next. Poland will be next. Something like that. So let's delve in to find out what actually did happen uh, in the, the year or so, especially and even more than that, before the war broke out in February of 2022, you may be surprised by some of what you find out. And these folks are things that are facts. These are not subject uh, questions that we have or theories or whatever. This is rooted in things that actually happened. And when you see coming out of the very mouths of some of the people that were engaged at the time, it'll give you a new perspective on this war and especially on where it may go from here. And literally there is no one better to talk about this than Colonel Jacques Boyd bowed. We had him on uh, a week or so ago. And in fact, some of the things he said during that time just really opened my eyes that uh, I couldn't wait to have him back to talk more on that issue about the origins. And, uh, and we do have him back today. So Colonel, welcome back to the show. Really glad to have you. Thank you. Nice. Uh, nice to be back with you. And uh, that's nice to invite me. That's, uh, I'm looking forward for this show. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so and, uh, people, I recommend just go to, to Amazon and, and Google your name on the title because a lot of the books you've written and, and for sure refer to them as we go through here, because I know a lot of the things are covered in detail in some of your books for anybody who wants to go deeper. Uh, but we're going to jump right into it. So I, I, I want to just kind of show you uh, in this compact little clip here that Gary put together. Uh, how people have been relentlessly saying, Western leaders from the beginning, how this is unprovoked and unjustified. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine without provocation, <clears throat> without justification. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is an unprovoked war of aggression. Russia's unprovoked, unwarranted war uh, on Ukraine has kicked off a humanitarian crisis that- We are united in condemning the Kremlin's unprovoked aggression. Ukraine is facing a barbaric, unprovoked military assault. Putin's latest attack on Ukraine was premeditated and totally unprovoked. He rejected repeated, repeated efforts at diplomacy. We are not going to boost any security agreements or start any security agreements with the government of Russia, a government that we have seen invade one of its neighbors uh, unprovoked. So according to the president on, on his State of the Union address uh, a week or so after the invasion happened, the, the Russian attack was unprovoked. It was premeditated. And he is you know, going to continue on until he conquers all of Ukraine. And it, there, as we find out, it wasn't quite that clear cut that, that it was unprovoked because the way it's being characterized, Colonel, is that basically Russia was just one day Putin woke up and said, you know what, let's go. Let's go get them. Let's just take off in there. Ukraine was sitting there and they wouldn't do anything. And all of a sudden, here comes these tanks. Uh, not quite the way it was, was it? Absolutely. In fact, uh, this war was, let's say, planned. I could say, by the West and even by the Ukrainians themselves. And here we have to be careful. As a preliminary remark, we have to make a distinction between the reason why Russia entered Ukraine and, on the other hand, the objectives that Russia is will be uh, seeking through that uh, opportunity, I would say. But the West created that opportunity. And in fact, we have 
Uh, probably we have to go back a little bit to the Maidan uh, issue because even there, a lot of people don't understand what happened. And that's the, the root causes of everything that happened later. So what happened just before Maidan? In 2012, 2013, Ukraine was contemplating the idea of joining the EU. And the idea was, of course, of course to have an economic tie between Ukraine and, and, and EU. But that, that was, there was a big problem with that. And the problem is that during the Cold War, Ukraine was, as you know, part of the Soviet Union. And in the Soviet Union, I make the story short, but in, in the Soviet Union, every single republic had a kind of division of labor with Russia. Meaning that you had, as, as an example, uh, for instance, to produce uh, um, Russian or Soviet fighters, the engines were produced in Ukraine. And, but the engines produced in Ukraine could be used only in Soviet fighters, could not be used in Western fighters. And after the war, Ukraine continued to have these uh, economic and industrial relationship with Russian, uh, Russia. By entering into EU and redirecting the whole economy towards uh, EU, that had a problem because the um, Ukrainian industry was not suited for the European market. Therefore, the so, Ukrainian. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So even even after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the division of labor, relatively say, continued on. So Ukraine was still making stuff that only Ukraine was making that was needed for the the Russian army. Is that accurate? Exactly. Yeah. That, that's that's Not the it. in essence. This is the idea. And <clears throat> as the the um, the Ukrainian identified this problem, they they entered contact with, with Russia and asked if we could have some kind of arrangement that would allow Ukraine to join EU while maintaining um, uh, 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 the, the same kind of relationship with Russia. And Russia said, okay, we can have a kind of tripartite uh, uh, agreement so that you, you have a kind of a free trade uh, agreement with EU, and you keep the existing arrangement with Russia. So that would include more or less uh, Russia in some kind of uh, free trade with, with Ukraine and Ukraine free trade with U EU. And uh, that's no, no, the, that would seem to be a really good thing for Ukraine because it would expand their economic opportunities, not redirect it or shift it, but actually expand it to include potentially both, right? Absolutely. And that was the idea. The problem is that the European Union refused that. Manuel mm. José Barroso, who used to be the predecessor of uh, Ursula von der Leyen, said, no, there is no way. It's either EU or Russia. It's not end, end. It's or, or, period. And hence, the, the 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 discussions, the negotiations that were already ongoing on this issue had to be paused because that was a problem that has to be solved by the Ukrainian leadership. And so President Yanukovych asked for a pause, not for a stop, but a pause. The problem is that in the West, we represented or we, we advertised, so to say, this pause as a stop. And that triggered a first Maidan protest, which was very peaceful at the beginning. Uh, that was just citizens asking for uh, continuing the discussion with the EU and, uh, and so on and so forth. But that was very peaceful. Problem is that the US and namely, uh, again, to make the things short, Victoria Nuland, who was in charge with the issue of, of Ukraine, uh, saw here an opportunity to create a situation that would harm Russia. And hence started a second phase of Maidan, where you had literally agent provocateur. They were sent to Kiev, uh, 
and started a violent uprising against President Yanukovych. And we know that they were agent provocateurs. You know, you, were, you may remember that during these, um, these uh, protests, you had uh, um, protesters being shot allegedly right, yeah. by the government. Well, last year, uh, Ukrainian court, Ukrainian court acknowledged that these protesters who were shot were not were shot by agent provocateurs and not by the government. Really? The, the Ukrainian government recognized the Ukrainian. it. It's a court in Vinitsa, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so we know today that these, the whole issue was literally provoked and the situation was deliberately set on fire in order to provoke the withdrawal of, uh, of Yanukovych. And in fact, what happened on the 21st of February uh, 2014, yeah. that the, the protesters made an agreement, signed an agreement with Yanukovych in order to organize new elections new election. and, and, new election. and have a new a change, in fact, in the government. And interestingly enough, France and Germany were the guarantors of this uh, first agreement. But two days later, Yanukovych was ousted of the, 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 the government. And in fact, it was toppled and a new government, an unelected government came into power. Yeah. And he, here came, the, came the, the, very, the, the first, very first start of the Donbass issue. Because the very first law that those new um, people who, who, who came to the, the power, yeah. they were ultranationalists. Uh, they came from Vov, not from, from uh, Kiev. This is also important to say. These are Westerners, in fact, yeah. Western, Western Ukrainians. And their first action was, in fact, to abolish the law that made Russian an official language. In fact, in, in Ukraine so far, you had uh, a, a, a several langu languages because there are several minorities, including the Hungarian minority, Romanian minority, and so on and so forth. And the, the Russian and Ukrainian, since they were the most spoken languages, both were official language, meaning that you could address your administration either in Ukrainian or in Russian. Even at school, the two languages were uh, equally uh, taught at uh, students and so on and so forth. But by abolishing that law, that, meant, that meant that only Ukrainian was the official language and Russian was just a usual language to be used at home, but not uh, in a business with the government. And that triggered a huge amount of protests in the whole Ukraine. And maybe I can show you probably if I can make it, uh, I will try to show you the map of these. Uh, I don't know if you see the map. Yeah, yeah, I can see the, it. The mass of the protests that erupted just after this decision. And you can see that the whole southern part of the, the Russia, of uh, Ukraine, sorry, just uh, 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 flared up, and of course, the, the this is the number of locations where you had protests, and you see that the, the the number were very strong in the Donbass area, very strong in the Odessa area, and of course Crimea, and <clears throat> but that that's exactly what what happened. The whole country uh, uh, fired up, and that's but so so everything in that on that screen everything in the gray area there was not a lot of protests because they were okay with the russian language being taken away but everything in the red protests these are mostly ukrainians uh, russian speaking areas and in the rest of ukraine this is mostly ukrainian speaking area that's why you see this difference but you see for instance that in kiev uh, itself, you had protests because obviously in the capital you have uh, both languages equally represented. But that's very much what the situation that happened in uh, after Maida. The problem is that wow. in order to 
cope with that situation. The the um, um, uh, sorry, the, the the government, the new government, had to send the army, and they started to send the army. But this was not very effective because part of the army was, uh, in fact, also Russian speaking. And that's the reason why you had in the Donbass. And I remember because, as I told you, uh, when I was in NATO, I was in NATO at the time, I was in charge of monitoring the flow of uh, small arms uh, in, uh, in, in the region and in particular in the, um, in the, uh, in the Donbass area. And we we were we wondering how the the um, the rebels could get weapons, and in fact we noticed that whole units, whole Ukrainian units, Russian speaking units, in fact defected to the rebels, and that's what happened in in Crimea. That's what happened in the Donbas. In fact, in the whole south of the country. As a result the army was no longer reliable to um, maintain law and order. And the government started to create militias and hence come those ultra-nationalists, even neo-Nazi militias like Pravi Sector, um, the um, uh, Azov, the Azov units and so on, which later evolved into regiment, even brigades. And <clears throat> These units were, in fact, paramilitary forces and started to maintain order. The problem was, was that these units were ultranationalists. Yeah. And when you say ultranationalists, well, you could say extremists and so on, meaning that what happened on the ground was definitely a breakout of violence. And the... Uh, these units started to uh, to uh, confront the local population in the whole south of the country. And what you had very quickly, and if I come back to my presentation, uh, here, okay, I will go. You had in September uh, uh, 20, um, uh, 2014, you had a completely different situation and, and you had those autonomist movements started to create independent republics. Nobody talks about them, but these were, uh, in fact, uh, organized as uh, the movement of Navarrosia, which uh, comprises, and you can recognize the whole south of the country where you had all these protests before, with, with they create some kind of popular republics and the, the, the last two that remained at the end was the, the Republic of Donetsk and the other one of Lugansk. All the others were crushed down by those militia. In Odessa, that was uh, particularly brutal. And there has been some massacres uh, uh, in, in all these regions. Anyway, that, that was really almost civil war at that time. And in fact, you had military operations uh, uh, against the, the autonomists or rebels, and you, you had really action of, of war in, the, in this part of, the, uh, uh, of, of Ukraine during the, in the end of 2017. And that's- So really by, by September of 2014, if I'm understanding your, your map here correctly, most of those that, that sprang up after the, the violence had started trying to have independence movements in their own were crushed, leaving only Luhansk and Donetsk, which basically exactly. was things kind of solidified for many years thereafter and the line of contact and all that. Um, I, I wonder, Carl, if I, if I could uh, <clears throat> just kind of, uh, obviously we don't have time to go through the whole thing right here, but then, you know, they had the whole Minsk agreement starting the following year and all the attempts to try to reconcile everything. And I know we could spend literally a whole show on that and actually uh, probably want to uh, when we have you back on the next time. Uh, but in the interest of time here, I want to leap forward to where things really started going sideways here. And I think this is one of the places that the Western audience really doesn't know what was going on. Now, what? in in March of 2021, uh, Zelensky made a declaration, which I think really lit the fuse here. And I think from what you said, you may agree here. Uh, he wrote uh, this declaration of a policy. Gary, if you can throw that one up there. Yeah. Uh, for the deoccupation and reintegration of 
of Crimea. And I think this was one of the hottest issues because part of that declaration read that on the strategy of deoccupation and reintegration of the temporary occupied territory of Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. Now, of course, when you're talking about Crimea, that that that's one of the almost sacred areas that that can that Putin considers Russian territory. And when you're talking about taking action like that, then, you, of course, now then you're talking about the possibility uh, of war. And in fact, the very next month, uh, this headline popped up that Zelensky himself is saying that all options are on the table to retake Crimea, even war. So you had Ukraine, exactly. not Russia claiming that they may use war to retake Crimea. What if you could tell us about what was going on up at that point? Well, exactly. I think this is this is something nobody mentioned. I have mentioned that in my books. And in fact, it's when you read the texts, it's not just Crimea. It's also the whole south of the country that include the Donbass, in fact. When you read the text of the decree, it's a quite long decree. And uh, when you, you study it, it's, it goes a little bit beyond Crimea. But that's... That's fine. Now, Crimea, I just want to make a point about Crimea. Crimea uh, was in January 1991, actually the, tw the 20th of January 1991, uh, uh, you had a referendum. The population of Crimea asked for a referendum to be detached from Ukraine and to be under Moscow, directly under Moscow and no longer under Kiev. And in fact, this referendum came good for the, the Crimeans. And at this, at this point was created the Autonomous Republic, Socialist Republic of Crimea. At this point, Ukraine was not yet independent. Ukraine got it in, in, its independence six months later with another referendum, by the way. So the referendum in Crimea was the first autonomy referendum in the Soviet Union. Mm. The problem is that Crimea, uh, Ukraine, sorry, never acknowledged the result of that referendum. As a result, as soon as uh, Ukraine became independent, it in fact re-annexed Crimea. It's abolished in 1994. I didn't even know that. Yeah, because, you know, the, the problem is that we tend to discard everything that disturbs us in the history. But the, the reality is this one, that Ukraine in 1994 abolished forcefully the constitution of Crimea. Wow. And, That's amazing. And with special forces in Sebastopol, this uh, uh, toppled the government in Crimea. The president was ousted forcefully by Ukrainian special forces. So, and since 1995, in fact, you had kind of tug of war between Ukraine and, um, and Crimea to solve the situation. And uh, the Crimean have asked several times to Russia to intervene into the, the debate, but probably for also because Russia was quite weak during that period, yeah. because they didn't want to interfere in that problem because they, they had not no longer the political will, the political power, and even probably the military power to do anything. And for that reason, in fact, the conflict remained at Ukraine level. And when, in 2014, when the language issue uh, emerged, then the Crimeans decided to make a new referendum referring to the referendum of January 1991. That was never reported in the West. No one ever made those connections. Yeah, of course, nobody does it because that would completely discredit the whole narrative. And, and for that reason, nobody oh. talked about it. And, and that's, in fact, that's the basis for the referendum of February 2014. And therefore, the annexation, the so-called annexation, in fact, it's not an, annexa an annexation as such, because the referendum that was conducted in February 2014 was the people 
asking the Ukrainian authorities to ask Russia for joining the Russian Federation. So in fact, it's not Russia that annexed the territory. It is the authorities of Crimea who ask joining Russian Federation and Russian Federation accepted. Right. Now, then things take a bit of a turn. So that was in February. Then this, that, this, uh, we, like I said, we, we jumped up to, uh, to, uh, March of 2021 and then, and then right away, Putin says, yeah, that's not going to work. And so there starts to be this big buildup. And that's the first of the big buildups that started in, in April 2021, to which uh, Zelens uh, Stoltenberg of NATO called it out and said this. Russia's uh, considerable military buildup is unjustified, unexplained, and deeply concerning. Russia must end this military buildup uh, in and around Ukraine stop its provocations and de-escalate immediately. So NATO's position was that this is unprovoked and that Russia is escalating up and they have to de-escalate and he commanded them to, to move down. But that didn't play very well in Russia, as I understand. Well, uh, actually, there's even another step that we tend to forget. There's another one, because in July 2021, the Ukrainian parliament adopted a law that make a distinction between citizens according to their ethnicity, making the Russians, in fact, second-class citizen of Ukraine. And that, uh, that was, the law was adopted on the 1st of July, 2021, on the 12th of July 2021, Vladimir Putin wrote a long article in, in, in a paper as a kind of response to that law, explaining that there is no reason to make a difference between Ukrainians and Russians because they have the same history, they have the same uh, uh, origin, and so on and so forth. What Western commentators have interpreted as uh, anticipation of the, um, the, the the Russian offensive in Ukraine because they say, well, that's a way of Putin not recognizing the existence of Ukraine. But in fact, the, if you read the, the article of Vladimir Putin, it's exactly the opposite. He recognized the sovereignty of Ukraine. He recognized the authority of Ukraine on its territory, but he advises against making a difference between Ukrainian I mean, ethnic Ukrainians and ethnic Russians. The problem of that distinction is that it, it was a base for making war against the Russians. And if you, if I explained before that those who supported the, the government in 2014 and later were ultranationalists. And when I say ultranationalists, it's very close to neo-Nazi. And when you read what they say, they say literally, that the um, that the Russians were an untermenschen. That means they were yeah. unhuman. You know, these yeah. you you're human. That's the, the expression that the uh, the Nazi used against the Jews during the Second right, World War. Right, right, right. So, so you're saying though that 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 uh, letter that that Putin wrote that was widely reported here in the West was not a prelude to him launching a war, but you're saying it was a response to that law to try and prevent war from the Russian side against the Russian speakers. Is that right? That's perfectly so. And, and I think that, that's important because the idea of Vladimir Putin was precisely to solve the issue in the Donbass. The Donbass was essentially not separatist, as the, our media say, but they were autonomist. And by the way, if you read the Minsk agreements, the idea was to provide the Donbass region uh, a limited autonomy within the borders of Ukraine. The idea was to have kind of a federal system very close to what you have in the United States, but with probably other aspects, more cultural, like the uh, language, for instance. In the, in the US, uh, the official language is, uh, is, is English. 
but in in uh, in Ukraine, the idea was to have different languages according to the uh, the, the region, and but the the region will still belong to Ukraine, and in fact, up to the fifteenth of February twenty twenty two. Vladimir Putin refused all queries to have or requests to have uh, those republic attached to the, the Russian Federation. They said those those uh, region belong to Ukraine. That was the official Russian position. The problem is that based on everything we have said, the the Ukrainians started to build up a war. Now, why did they want to make war against the Donbass? And that's also something that the West never says. I have a video, but I'm not sure I can I can play it here on this show. I can probably send you the link and you can probably afterwards, maybe if you want to, to, to uh, show it. It's an interview of Alexei Arestovich of mm. March 2019. And he explains that because of the ongoing conflict with Russia, NATO would never accept to have Ukraine into NATO. And that's logic because the NATO, NATO charter, that you can't have a border dispute and join NATO. Exactly. I mean, because of the Article 5, if you enter NATO with a dispute, then the chances are good that the whole alliance could be involved in a conflict. Therefore, the idea is that those new members don't have any dispute so that the uh, alliance is not uh, uh, forced to go into conflict. But <clears throat> in Ukraine, there was a conflict. And the idea that had the, the Ukrainian leadership, Alexei Arestovich is a personal advisor to Zelensky, by the way. So it's important that to right. say that. And the interview was made just before his election. And that uh, Alexei Arestovich confirmed that later. But anyway, the idea was to have a war. And he explains that in plain words, he explains the, the name of the game is not to have a war with Russia. We would be helped by the West to defeat Russia through sanctions and all that. And based on the defeat of Russia, we will be able to enter NATO because then Russia will not be any challenge for the Ukraine. So that okay, was so the idea. Uh, that's, yeah, that's something that's not been talked about here at all. And in fact, you talk about, so basically they're trying to lay the foundation for this. Now, I wonder to what extent, because you mentioned this a little bit in our last show, there was a 2019 CSIS report, which you said kind of laid out the foundation for exactly what we did. It's, it's called Extending Russia, Competing for Advantageous Ground. And when you look at the, even just the chapter headlines in this book, 2019, you see all, like nearly everything that we've done here is found somewhere in that book and how we responded to it. So the question is, and I don't know if you know the answer, but what is your guess based on Aristovich's comments in that same year that this was part of a larger plan that they actually wanted to accomplish? Well, I think, no, there was two different things, but they converge at one point. And, and, and probably that's the, the um, interest of, of Ukraine converge with the interest of the U.S., in fact. And in fact, the, there's a good match between what the Rand Corporation wrote in this report, the, the report you just mentioned. And by the way, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, if you look at just the, the, the title of the, 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 uh, the, the chapters, you would see that everything that we have witnessed in the last two years, including uh, 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 Finland and Sweden joining NATO and all that, everything is already in this report. So we, we, the, 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 the plan was quite extensively explained in that, in that document, and it matched the objective of, of Ukraine. And in fact, we have in, uh, in February 2022, we have the convergence of those two strategies, and we have, in fact, the start of the of the, the this war now when i said february i don't say the 24th of february i said i would say it, the the war started effectively on the 16th of february and um why that because at this point 
the OSC observers noted a drastic increase in shelling the Donbass. And, um, and, and it's important also to say that it's a shelling of the Donbass by the Ukrainians, because I, I, I looked at, through all the reports that the OSC observers have done, and they describe exactly in which zone they heard the explosions and all that. And I, when you make the, 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 the work of identifying where the explosions are, you see that it was act, uh, effectively the, um, the, the, the Ukrainians shelling and bombing the Donbass. Okay, and, well, let, me, let me ask you a question. There. So uh, on that point, so let me back yep. up just a little bit for so by November 2021, so just a few months before that, uh, the, the Russian buildup on the on the for, uh, for, uh, foundations of Ukraine uh, began to increase. And then there was yet another uh, warning uh, about that buildup. And Putin had a response back then. Watch this. Tensions are rising between Russia and the West over Kiev's renewed bid to join the NATO military alliance. For the Kremlin, any expansion of military aid to Ukraine is a red line. We can't ignore these threats to the security of Russia. We will react to them as appropriate, adequately to the situation. So he gave a warning there that that he would take action if because uh, there was a big push in there. And I remember Stoltenberg emphatically pointing a finger and saying the the 2008 Bucharest agreement will still be in effect. Uh, you know, basically saying we're not going to back down no matter what. We're going to continue on. And so the question comes if when Ukraine, when NATO was saying that we you know, were emphasizing we're going to allow the the Ukraine side to come in. Uh, what was the benefit of the Ukraine side ramping up artillery attacks in the middle of February before the 24th? Well, that's, the idea was precisely to attack Donbas, to provoke, in fact, uh, Russia. And they knew this was happening because, and in fact, the, the Ukrainians have mentioned several times the example of Georgia. In Georgia in 2008, we had exactly the same situation. The uh, the uh, the Russian minority in South Ossetia was bombed by the government, and that led to an in, a Russian intervention into Georgia in in the South Ossetia region to, in fact, to stabilize the the situation and to protect the population of South Ossetia. And the the Russians invoked the responsibility to protect at the UN, which is a UN principle. And that's exactly what they did for the Donbass. So they knew, the, the Ukrainians knew that by attacking the Donbass, that would provoke the, uh, the intervention. Now, why provoke an intervention? In fact, I, uh, the, what, what we can, I could see from uh, later interviews from Zelensky is that the, the expectations towards the effectiveness of the sanction where we are so high that in fact, Ukrainians didn't expect to fight very long. The idea was that the sanctions would be so massive, so sudden and, and so international that it would, it would bring Russia into collapse within, within days, in fact. And- it Would bring that, Russia to collapse. Russia to collapse, yeah. That was the idea. Yeah, that was the idea. And, and, and is that and, springing back from that 2019 uh, uh, CSIS report? Is that also what they projected or argued? This is this is what they mentioned. The, the, the report of 2019 is very interesting because apparently those guys from the rank operation were tasked to provide a kind of a strategy to uh, weaken Russia through an action in Ukraine. But interestingly enough, if you read up to the, the, the end, or not quite to the end, I think if you go to the page 100 or so of the report, you will see that the Rand Corporation guys caution the, 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 the West uh, against using that strategy. They say, well, you may well use that strategy, but the risk of this strategy are huge for Ukraine. And in fact, Ukraine may have a huge loss of soldiers. You may have huge 
uh, uh, flow of immigration from from Ukraine. Ukraine may lo lose a wow. lot of territories, and Ukraine may be pushed into a disadvantageous peace process. That's exactly what you see today. So, so now, now let me ask you: Why? Where was the error in the calculations that the sanctions would bring Russia to their knees and cripple them within days or even weeks? Why did that not happen? Well, the thing is that in 2014, as the West accused Russia to, in, to uh, invade Ukraine, in fact, there had never been any invasion of Ukraine by Russia uh, in 2014 and even later until 2022, the, Russia, the Russian army didn't invade uh, 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 Ukraine. You had in Crimea, you had a contingent according to the existing status of force agreement between Ukraine and Russia. You had uh, at that stage, you had, you had 20,000 soldiers stationed in Crimea, but you had no addition of soldiers after the crisis 2014. And in the Donbass, you had absolutely no uh, intervention of the uh, Soviet military, the Russian military. And in fact, this was confirmed by both the head of the Ukrainian security service, the SBU, and even the chief of the Ukrainian general staff said, both of them, that they had no Russian units in the Donbass. So we know that all the accusations that were uh, uh, in, in our media were totally wrong. By the way, I was, uh, as I said, in, in NATO at the time, everybody was talking about invasion, and we received a, a kind of an advisory uh, in, in, in NATO to say, no, we shouldn't talk about invasion, we should talk about intervention, which is a broader term, but there was actually no invasion. So if I remember correctly from the last time you were on here, we actually showed a clip of, of some of the newscast at the time where they said the, quote, little green men were actually Russian soldiers that had come over and taken off their uh, paraphernalia and their rank and insignia and all that. But you say that those were actually Ukrainian units, Russian speaking, that flipped and took off their stuff and went to fight there. And that's the, the, the origin of those troops. Did, did I remember that correctly? Absolutely. This is absolutely correct. And this is not my invention, because this was said on Ukrainian TV by, uh, um, by uh, uh, um, a lawmaker. It was a Ukrainian lawmaker who said that. So this is this is something which is absolutely known. All these this sort the Russian speaking soldiers were in fact Ukrainian soldiers. Out of the twenty thousand Ukrainian soldiers stationed in the peninsula, twenty thousand defected to the Russians. Wow. Yeah, that's not reported here at, at all. Really. That that was on the TV and, and uh, on Ukrainian TV, and that uh, I I can provide you the uh, the screenshot if you if you want uh, the latest. Yeah, screenshot. yeah, I'd love to see that sometime. So so you see now going all the way back the picture you painted going all the way back to 2013 even, uh, and all the changes, the laws that were declared in Ukraine the issues when Crimea going back even before the 2014, frankly, uh, all these things are moving up. And then now then we actually have Russia for whatever reason, calculating that now intervention is necessary. So he moves across in there uh, in, on the 24th of February and Putin does uh, far uh, order the invasion. Now, initially it seemed that, that uh, Vladimir, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky recognized, Oh shoot, this is not going to work out the way I had hoped. Uh, they didn't collapse here quickly. And now then Russians are have taken at that time like 20 percent of his country. And there were talks about negotiations uh, that later would be in Istanbul in, in March and then early April. And but heading into that, Zelensky made the comment that uh, I would consider neutrality. We will consider some of these things. So it looked like there may be an off ramp pretty quickly. But just before that, uh, President Biden went out and made this really incendiary comment that uh, got a lot of notice at the time. But I want to ask you here, what reaction did this have on the on the Russian side and what did this have to do towards peace? Watch this. Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia, for free people refused to live in a world of hopelessness and darkness.
we will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principles, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. So that, like, says we're actually looking for regime change here. What impact did that have on Vladimir Putin, and especially days later, the collapse of the Istanbul talks? To because we we there's a step missing here probably on the so the the offensive started on the 24th of February, on the 25th of February, one day after the, the, the beginning of the, the operation, Zelensky asked for negotiations. He called the Swiss foreign minister and asked to have a, a peace conference. Oh, and, I'm not aware of that. Well, <laughs> so, well, we have you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason I'm here. Uh, yeah. And that means that, in fact, you had several attempts to have an agreement. And again, the, the whole issue for the Russians were not so much to take over Ukraine, but as Vladimir Putin said on the 24th of February, he said he had two objectives, denazify and demilitarize the threat against the population of Donbass. Now, the thing is that the military, the, the Russian military thinking is a Clausewitzian type of uh, thinking. That means that the reason for going into Ukraine was to solve the, the threat or to, to uh, eliminate the threat against the population of Donbass. But by achieving this objective, the idea was that Russia could ask a little bit more, in fact. And that's exactly what happened on March 22nd, uh, on March 2022, as you mentioned. And <clears throat> that, that, of course, was not uh, planned by the West. The West, and this is interesting because on the 1st of March 2022, the French um, uh, Minister of Economy said on the TV, he said, we will bring the Russia to collapse. So the idea was very much to make the uh, Russia to collapse and hence all these sanctions. And at, at the beginning, they expected the Russia to collapse. Uh, with one package of sanction, because in 2014 they noticed that uh, the Russian economy was weak, weak uh, was quite weak, and it needed not so much to push the economy into collapse, and that's what they tried to do in uh, 20. Uh, 22. The problem is that between 2014 and 2022, Putin understood the threat that was on his uh, on his country and he tried to let's say solidify and and make his uh, his economy more robust more resilient and that's exactly what we happen for instance as an example um russia tried to reduce its external debt for instance and and uh, at the beginning of the war or the the military offensive russia had one uh, is one of the country of the ocde that has the lowest external debt meaning that when you have no debt then of course you are less vulnerable to sanctions because you have no obligations everything that happens is just within your country and then you can solve the problem within your country so having more uh, financial independence is in fact reducing a vulnerability against sanctions and that's that's by the way on the on a completely different uh, 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 range if you want uh, that's the problem that us may face in right. the future that's a, that's a, a that's a considerable weakness to have an external debt and especially, it, this, negotiate, especially yeah. of this degree in that weight okay. Uh, absolutely. And and the, the Russians have understood that, the Chinese have understood that as well. And that's the reason why today you have a, such a robust uh, uh, economy in, in, um, in Russia. They also developed alternative because they knew the idea, for instance, of uh, ousting uh, Russia out of the SWIFT system. The SWIFT yeah. system is a bank transfer system. And... Um, 
a communication system basically yeah. and yeah. the um, since in 2014 this was this idea was this idea was floating around and the russian at that time started to develop an alternative to the SWIFT system for within the country and with a friend, a friendly countries, and including China, for instance. And that's, that system today is 100% functional. So uh, being out of SWIFT system, for instance, has absolutely no uh, uh, consequence uh, whatsoever because uh, Russia is totally independent. Yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, so, so bottom line is that, that Basically, they were looking ahead and kind of shielded themselves, and that's one of the reasons why this stuff didn't work. Uh, listen, but I, I don't want to let you get off here before we talk a little bit, because we have definitely now established this was far from unprovoked. You can still argue Russia shouldn't have invaded, that there was other things they could do. I'll leave that for other people. But without question, there were many things done by the West and Ukraine in particular uh, that were very uh, provokish for, for Russia. And so... We have to bear that in mind when we talk about what may come next. But I want to specifically ask you in the, in the remaining time we have here uh, about what may come next in this uh, post-terrorist attack in Moscow, because there are some uh, real possibilities that this thing could expand. Now, in the immediate aftermath, uh, you know, of course, everybody said, oh, it was ISIS. They had a video. They showed the flag and, and all that. It was uh, you know, certainly Islamic extremists uh, that, that carried out part of this, or at least Islamic people. Uh, in, but in the immediate aftermath there, shortly after, already eyes in Russia were looking to Ukraine fingerprints. Zelensky immediately on the second day said this. What happened yesterday in Moscow is obvious. Both Putin and other scoundrels simply try to blame everything on someone else. They always resort to the same methods. It's been done before. Yesterday, all this happened. And this absolute miserable Putin, instead of attending to his own citizens of Russia, addressing them, remained silent for a day, thinking about how to link this with Ukraine. Everything is absolutely predictable. Those hundreds of thousands of Russians who are now killing on Ukrainian land would surely be enough to stop any terrorists. And if the Russians are ready to silently die in crocus halls and not ask any questions to their security and intelligence agencies, then Putin will try to turn such a situation to his personal advantage again. But in fact, the people in Russia did turn to their FSB intelligence services. And yesterday he said this. Ну, мы считаем, что акцию э, готовили как сами радикалы исламисты, так естественно способствовали западные спецслужбы. А э, сами, э, сами спецслужбы Украины к этому имеют не, непосредственное отношение. Я думаю, что это. And also, I believe it was yesterday, uh, Putin said. There's issues, as he mentioned there, that the FSB director, that he thinks that it was Western directed from his perspective. Putin seemed to echo that. This has led to their attempts to penetrate our borders and their shellings of Russian civilian infrastructure, including energy infrastructure, their attempts to make strikes at the Crimean Bridge, the Crimean Peninsula. These steps make up a logical sequence of terrorist attacks and attempts to intimidate the Russian society and sow discord, and at the same time to show their own population that the Kiev regime is still strong, that the only thing people need is to obey the orders, the orders that come from Washington, fight to the last Ukrainian. So given that Putin made over the years many warnings and threats, which he subsequently made good on here, what do you think is going to come next? What, what will Russia do in light of, of what if if there really was? I don't know if there was. I don't have any idea. I don't have the intelligence. All I know is that if Russia believes that there was Western intelligence activity and if there was Ukrainian involvement, what is possible for a retaliation? Yes. First of all, we have to say there were indication that this would happen. And I, I even mentioned that in the public conferences in early February. So the, we, we knew that something was going on. Uh, they had indicated they were indication for that. What, what they just said that probably it's, uh, Western intelligence services together with some Islamists and with the support of Ukraine is 
probably the, the right direction. We are still speculating at this stage, but I think that's the scenario that seems to emerge, not because of what the Russians say, but because the, the indication that we have already on that. First of all, we know that the, the claim of, the, of the, 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 this attack by so-called ISIS, by the way, we say ISIS-K, but uh, nobody knows that it, I mean, the K is just a, a, a speculation. It's uh, the, the, in the text of the claim, it's ISIS, by the way. Also something interesting in the claim, which probably comes from the AMAC um, uh, uh, news agency. Yeah. They yeah. say in the claim that they were told that the Ukrainian, the, the, the ISIS were doing this attack. It's not the format that ISIS use when climbing an attack. When it's, when it's, uh, AMAC belongs to ISIS. So when ISIS makes an attack, they say plainly, ISIS conducted that attack with that objective. And they even state the objective because they know, because it comes from themselves. Now, when it's a third party, they use that formulation that AMAC was told by some source that mm -hmm. ISIS made this attack. And they don't state an objective because they don't know why this uh, attack uh, occurred. And that's, that's very interesting because in that particular claim, it, was, it referred to an external source and it didn't mention any objective. If it were ISIS, they would know exactly what the objective is. And in fact, if we look, I have another book that I published one and a half year ago about fighting jihadi terrorism. So I, I, I've studied hundreds of those claims. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in, in the, the usual claims, I mean, the, the claim of ISIS were systematically, when it's done by ISIS, all the claims on the objective is in fact to make the uh, to make stop the, uh, the the objective of ISIS is to 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 have the Westerners to withdraw from their intervention and to stop their intervention. That's systematically 100% of ISIS. Uh, uh, attacks in Europe had this objective. This has been written by ISIS in all forms and methods, and this was the objective. There is, there is no attack without objective, and the objective is this one. And it's not about our democracy and things like this. You, you don't you you don't destroy yeah. democracy by bombing a, a, a disco. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And they know that perfectly. And when you read the text of the Islamic State, you would see that these guys are extremely um, extremely insightful. They uh, they they're quite intelligent people. And I I, I used to be in a working group of the NATO about 15 years ago to assess the psychology of the, the Islamist terrorists. And in fact, we saw that in the average, these guys have a very high IQ. And that was also based on- They may on, be wicked, but they're very smart. They are very smart, very much more than we think actually. And, um, but in, in, that particular, in that particular case, um, the- um, Sorry. In that particular case, the um, this attack was probably not uh, decided by ISIS, and in fact, the way the guys were recruited, the way they they were uh, uh, committed, indicates that they were probably paid by a third party. But anyway, we we'll go uh, back to your question. Yeah. What's the, next? First part, of, first part of the answer is probably the strike that the uh, the Russians made on the headquarters or one headquarters of the SBU, so the Secret Service, and probably the Russians will go a little bit uh, uh, harsher at the institutions, especially the secret and intelligence services. They tried to do the same with uh, the military intelligence, uh, the Kirillo Budanov, uh, 
uh, where they tried to destroy, they, they destroyed the headquarters and tried to kill him. I'm not sure they, they, they I mean, I'm not sure they didn't uh, uh, achieve that objective, but the, um, the idea is probably that now they will, they will be hunting uh, the uh, in external uh, advisors, like Western advisors, and probably mm -hmm. the British and the French, <laughs> who are probably <laughs> involved in that in that uh, in that attack in some way. So, do I understand you correctly to say a second ago that you actually had some indicators of this as far back as February that something like this would come and that it could have some of these connections? Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. There were indications that it would happen. And uh, because that was a possible strategy, you know, the, the, the conventional war failed, basically. And the idea at that point, and that's probably also, that explains the whole issue with the advisory that was published by the U.S. Embassy on the 7th of March. Yeah. Because probably the calculation was to create some kind of destabilization in Russia in order to influence the elections. That, uh, that happened on mid-March. Now, uh, again, we can only speculate because I don't have uh, more information uh, th than the, the average people here, but most probably the, there was uh, uh, an attack planned for the 7th to 8th uh, of March. Uh, at the same place, because there was a very, uh, a very popular rock, yeah. uh, the shaman, who is a very popular rock singer in in uh, in, um, in Moscow. So, the, an attack was probably uh, planned at that point. But since the Russians took this advisory seriously and ramped up their the the, the security measures, it was not possible to conduct the. Um, Operation, uh, at the time. operation and probably the Russians assessed that all these attempted uh, attacks were to destabilize the election, and after the election, they probably lower lowered the the level of security because there was no longer point, and that's probably the reason why they were a little bit taken off so, guard. So then, then why? What would be the point then? If the, if the if they were trying to destabilize the election, which by itself seems like a foolish thing to do, because there was nobody else that could possibly have uh, changed that. It couldn't have changed the outcome any. So that was seeming weird. But if they missed that, then what would be the utility for the West or Ukraine, whoever uh, allegedly, you know, masterminded it? What would be the benefit? Because so far, it seems like all it's going to do is stir the hornet's nest up to strike even harder at Ukraine. Well, I think this is also something and that's why Frank, that that also explain why the, the, the U.S. is probably very cautious about this. Um, the the idea of the Ukrainians and probably some <clears throat> European intelligence services is that by trying to destabilize Russia, they, <clears throat> they could still provoke a kind of um, uh, 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 regime change in some way, and you 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 probably noticed that recently Ukraine conducted several attacks on oil refiner refineries within Russia, and and the the U.S. actually asked Ukraine to refrain from this kind of attacks because the what what the U.S. currently is looking at is to have some kind of a a solution, uh, let's put it that way. Um, I, I'm not saying that they want to accommodate the Russians, but they, Biden is losing um, its support within the US and probably having some kind of success in some kind of negotiation would be a, a, a positive a positive outcome for Biden. And that's probably the reason why they try to soften a little bit yeah. the Ukrainian stance. And so, that's now, there has been some some conversation, at least along some of the Russian telegram channels prior to this attack, that there had been some actual renewed possibilities for a, what they call an Istanbul three. Uh, exact deal where they wanted to get this apparently coming closer to have some negotiations, which now they claim uh, have been deep six because now then that there's so much anger in Russia that they don't want any negotiated settlement. They want a military victory. Does Russia have the capacity to act on that or will they get back to a, a willingness to have a negotiated settlement? 
Well, I, I think the Russians will try to press the Ukrainians into a settlement, but they will do it the hard way. So they will just deplete completely the potential of Ukraine, I think. That's, I think, the, the military potential anyway. But I think now they are reaching to the, um, the economic uh, uh, potential and, and probably other potential as well. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about uh, the uh, secret services and all that, and probably even the Westerners uh, uh, who are in, in, in Ukraine, because the, the idea would be almost to isolate Ukraine in some way. The, the US, in fact, is trying to push the Ukraine to discuss since December 22. In fact, uh, while there was not so, there were uh, timid uh, uh, attempts to do that. They didn't that very uh, strongly, but there was some advice coming from the Blinken side that probably Ukraine should start to open a door with with with. Uh, um, uh, yeah, there was a, in November of 2022, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, then Mark Milley emphatically directly exactly. said this is the best time for you to have a negotiated exactly. settlement you might want to move now but instead they just doubled exactly. down well in fact what happened is that zelensky because he, zelensky is pressed by his own uh, uh let's say the people around him press him not to negotiate. And I just want to remind you, we talked about 19, uh, 2019, just after he was elected in the Ukrainian media, Dmitry Yarosh, who is the head of a very huge militia in, uh, in Ukraine, which is the, the um, Ukrainian volunteer army. It's, a, it's an army that is totally independent from the Ministry of Defense. It's a totally volunteer, extreme right-wing army, still active in, in the... And this guy said in Ukraine media, if you, if you negotiate with the Russians, we'll kill you. Oh, wow. That was in the press. That was, that was in plain words in the Ukrainian press, meaning that Zelensky is on a very, very tight rope here. And, and you know, it's, it, it doesn't, it, it cannot move side, uh, uh, either on the left or right. He has a, it, 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 I think he is a very uncomfortable situation. And, and in order to prevent himself to negotiate with Russia, he even issued a decree that would prevent him yeah, yeah. Negotiating with Russia as long as Vladimir Putin is in in power, so that okay. means that despite all efforts from the U.S., Ukraine is still resisting. Uh, um, so that means that the key of the negotiation remains in Kiev, not in Washington, and right. <clears throat> and for that reason, the Russians will press and they will continue to press very hardly against the the the, the regime and probably even provoke a regime change. And that's, if you see recently, there was a head of the National Security Council in Ukraine that was, that was changed. There were, there was some, some changes within the leadership because in fact, the Zelensky feels the heat and uh, he sees that for the, the, his days or weeks maybe are in probably counted. Yeah. The so yeah. well, we are definitely going to continue watching this. Although I, I think, and we would like to have you back on to discuss this part later on. Uh, I think there's a higher chance that the Ukrainian army buckles before that, before the, the discussions get far enough along, if, especially if they don't go down that path. But that remains to be seen. Uh, listen, before we let you get go today, I, I know this some of the other uh works that you've worked on uh with the, some of your books are on the Middle East there. And, and I'd like to get your last comment here uh, on something that's unfolding right now between the United States and Israel and some of the conflict that's going on there uh, because it has a lot of ramifications for where that war goes. So first of all, I'd like to show you just this real quick uh, beat here that um, uh, Netanyahu, uh, after a meeting by uh, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, said, yeah, I know you don't want us to go into Rafa, but we're going to do it. And Check out how he said this. Netanyahu 
שאין לנו דרך לנצח את החמאס בלי להיכנס לרפיח ולחסל את שארית הגדודים שם. ואמרתי לו שאני מקווה שנעשה את זה בתמיכה של ארצות הברית, אבל אם נצטרך, נעשה זאת לבד. So he's basically saying, yeah, whatever you say, we're going to do whatever we want. But Farid Zakaria actually had a pretty good observation on CNN. I think it was last night to where he's saying Netanyahu may actually have gone too far. What he is doing is he's wrecking the trust that has built over decades between Israel and the United States. And what he's doing is creating a, 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 an idea that the United States can be pro-Israel without being pro-Bibi. Israel can be a close ally, but Bibi Netanyahu might not be a close ally. What do you make of that? Has Netanyahu gone too far, or is he almost like Zelensky has uh, trapped himself into this position based on things he said in the past? Well, the problem of Benjamin Netanyahu is that, first of all, he is facing also court charges and, and remaining in power is the only way to escape that. So for that reason, he still continues to proceed with his war and, and, and thinks that he is invulnerable at that stage. But this is probably not the case. And I think there are two aspects that uh, we have to consider. First of all, I'm not sure he will um, defeat Hamas even if he enters Rafa. Uh, the, uh, the Hamas is a very sophisticated organization. We have seen that in all the parts in which IDF has entered Gaza, they have not been able to uh, control the, the, the territory they are on. So meaning that uh, the Hamas is still very much in charge of everything there. So that's the first uh, 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 tactical operational side of it. They, at the strategic level, if he enters Rafa, it will probably encourage the international community to consider definitively that uh, Israel is committing genocide. And I think that's a very strategic, important thing because the International Court of Justice already end of January established that there was a possibility of a genocide. And since then, nothing indicates that um, Israel are by, abode by, the, uh, by the, the decisions of the International Court of Justice, and we are heading towards uh, uh, the accusation of genocide. And that would be catastrophe for Israel. We have to realize that what happened, if Israel is, is considered as a genocidal state, how will the U.S. still provide weapons to a genocidal, genocidal state? Yeah, I actually had a conversation last night with, with someone who said there was, there was some interesting corollaries to the South African uh, situation, where the U.S. used to be a blanket support to the South African regime. No, you know, and all these comments about uh, apartheid and all that, we just we would vote against any of that until it got to a, a, a period, I guess, a critical mass where it went over. And then all of a sudden we couldn't. And then we actually went, you know, with, I guess, the global community and it went against that. And we know how that ended up. Do you see something like that possible here for Israel? Yeah. Meaning could Biden or Bibi Netanyahu push too far to where it actually undercuts his own support in the West? Yes. But the problem is that, in fact, um, uh, Israel may be even more isolated than the South Africa used to be in the 60s or 70s. Because, in fact, when South Africa became isolated politically, especially as to weaponry and all that, they turned on to Israel. And, in fact, you had a lot of Israeli weapons provided to South Africa, despite the embargo. That was a huge issue. And uh, I can say that because uh, uh, at that time, Switzerland was not in the UN, was not a member of the UN because of neutrality and all that. And as a result, Switzerland still had contact with South Africa. And the, the South African intelligence had no contact anymore with European intelligence services, except with Switzerland. So we had, we had very, we had very uh, uh, interesting 
uh, discussions with, uh, sorry, uh, we had discussions with the intelligence uh, uh, there at that time. I was uh, invited uh, in South Africa, by the way, to discover the new Soviet weapons that were tested in South Angola. Uh, at that time, because the, the Soviets had the most modern weapons tested in, in Angola, and the South African uh, uh, could get them, and we, we anyway, so this is another story. Wow. But yeah. it, what I want to say is that there, there was um, there was a, a, a very close relationship between South Africa and Israel, but today Israel, it would be even more Israel. They will not be able to turn back to South Africa, obviously, and they will not be able to turn to their uh, allies. Regional, they have no regional allies, mm -hmm. and even Jordan and and Egypt are very. You know, they they had to sign a peace agreements with Israel, but they did that with a pistol or, or on on the head. Uh, but because the American forced them to sign agreement with Israel, they they did that reluctantly, and I I was I was even in in Jordan for for NATO uh, a couple of years ago, and I had the opportunity to discuss that with um, a Jordanian military, and I, I noticed that they have absolutely no appreciation for Israel whatsoever. They were just obliged to have an agreement with them. So they did that to please the Americans, but certainly not to please the Israelis. Yeah. And the, the, the real question is, you know, how far will that even that compulsion go? And I think that there is an end to that as well as several others. Well, listen, Colonel, thank you so much for coming on today. This has been an incredibly enlightening uh, episode. We're so very grateful to have you come on today to talk about this and cannot wait to have you back on again. Absolutely. No problem. With pleasure. <laughs> thank All you. Right, cool. Thank you very much. And, and again, thank you guys for coming on today. Uh, truly, you have seen something uh, pretty special here uh, that you're probably not going to get anywhere else because a lot of this information is breaking on this channel even as we have been having this show. So be sure to like and subscribe and definitely share this with your friends because they're going to want to hear this too. Uh, I will probably be coming live from New York City tomorrow because I'm going to be there with uh, our friend John Mearsheimer. We're going to be at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations debating on whether the U.S. should continue funding the Ukraine war or not with some on the other side of that uh, at the CFR. Uh, those of you who are part of the CFR will be able to watch that live, but otherwise uh, it'll be released in April sometime and we'll definitely alert you when that show comes on there. But look for us uh, somewhere live from New York City tomorrow and we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.